Welcome. This podcast is a collaboration of Religka and URI, United Religions Initiative. Why don't we begin by just saying a word about your own biography? Who are you as a, as a person and as a leader today? Thank you. So really, to approach that question, I go all the way back to my childhood and sitting around my grandparents' dinner table, which was often populated by people from around the world, from all beliefs, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, uh, tribal folks from Africa, Native Americans. Um, my, my grandparents' home was a home, a place of gathering for the many peoples of different cultures and beliefs of the world. And so from that very early childhood moment in my life, I knew that I was one among many. And that being one among many was a really cool thing. It was amazing. It's like I got to learn constantly by interacting with people of all cultures from around the world of all beliefs. I realized later in life that not everybody shares that enthusiasm about being one among many. And in fact, that people of different cultures and beliefs can evoke uh, a fear, fear of the other, fear of difference. But for me, it was totally not the case. I, I was just in a world of diversity, and it was the civil rights era in the United States. Dr. King and Rabbi Heschel and others were part of that group around my grandparents' table. So I was immersed in this grand human diversity, this pluralistic world that was fascinating for me. And my whole life has been about seeking to engage that diversity so that diversity of worldview, diversity of humanity, um, of all natural life is a, seen as a resource, not a barrier to us creating connected, peaceful, sustainable communities. So the arc of my life took me into working with young people. It took me into working with gangs in the South Bronx and peace building. It took me into working on housing and homelessness in Boston, um, mostly with marginalized communities who were treated as other, who were diminished in some way um, by others in society. And eventually that took me to, um, Wellesley College, where I became Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life and helped to develop what at that point was one of the early models of interfaith campus chaplaincy. Uh, it, it subsequently evolved into a religious diversity program and then further involved into being part of the multicultural efforts of the campus in terms of an educational program for all students where they learned how to be one among many on campus and in the world as part of their education. And I was there for 20 years um, and as a dean and also chair of the Peace Studies program before I ended up in 2013 coming to take on the role of executive director of URI, United Religions Initiative. I want to ask you more about your leadership in URI, but before I do this question or this comment about being one among many, when you think of this, it seems to me it's more than just, say, celebrating diversity, that pluralism is something that's rich and requires a significant response from us. How do you see the relationship between being one among many and the wealth of pluralism? One of the great tragedies in the religious and world, the religious and spiritual worlds, is the interpretation of the particular expression of uh, spirituality as it has manifested in different religions as being exclusive, as being the answer, as having full knowledge of some divine purpose or plan. Um, I believe that that is, in fact, antithetical to the essential spirit of all those traditions. I think it was a uh, human add-on that was meant to consolidate kind of power and privilege, and that the essential spiritual values of all traditions call us into a kind of radical humility in which we see ourselves as having powerful, unique, important, 
uh, and partial understanding of the world beyond us and of the spiritual world. And so that as a Christian myself to, to know in part, right? It's that great, great passage from Corinthians. Now I know in part only then face to face. Uh, now I know in part, I can only know partially because of my humanity. And to claim that I know more than that is, is actually idolatry. It, it is the, it's a fundamental breach of my own humility and acceptance of my humanity. And so pluralism for me and the call to, to celebrate being one among many is um, to both bring the fullness of my own beliefs and my own experience, but to do so in, an, in a humble way together with others that we might together discover something that we can't know on our own. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't critique. It doesn't mean we agree with everything. It doesn't mean we don't argue about this, that, or the other thing. But it means that we start from that place of an acceptance of the partiality of our knowing and therefore the importance of building understanding collectively. So you've been at United Religions Initiative since 2013 and you're speaking about the nature of radical humility and I'm just thinking of your leadership. How do those two go together? And could you say more for those who know or don't know about URI, its work and mission, what should they know about it? Yeah, so the the amazing thing about URI, what drew me to URI was that it was created in a completely reverse way than most religious or spiritual traditions organize themselves from the bottom up, which, which is not to diminish in any way the role of religious leaders, of formal religious who are charged with oversight of their congregation or of their community. But URI was created to honor and lift up the voices of ordinary people at the grassroots, just members, just folks who were part of communities, and to honor the wisdom that they bring about their own lives, about their traditions, and about the world. And so URI, the power in URI is vested at the grassroots. The people who are part of URI, which is a global network of interfaith groups called cooperation circles, who are self-organized, self-funded. We don't fund them. We don't tell them what to do. They determine what kind of humanitarian action they want to work on together in their communities because they know best. Um, and we support them through being a network, through connecting them, through training, through a communications platform, through mentoring and coaching from our regional offices. So global network in 109 countries, over a thousand groups, and those grassroots groups elect a board of trustees that governs the organization and that hires me. So I work for those grassroots groups. So for me, which is the perfect reflection of how I like to be engaged in work, um, it is about being in service to people at the grassroots. It's not about telling them what to do. It's not about directing or determining what they need. It's what I call being a spiritual midwife. And for me, being a spiritual midwife means that I have a set of skills and experiences that I've developed over the course of my lifetime, as do my team, the staff team at URI. And we're invited in by a community to help them birth the creative instinct, the creative possibilities that they want to see happen in their community. And they ask us, as, as like a midwife would be asked, to come in, offer those skills, and to help them birth their creative project. It's not ours. We don't tell them what to do. We don't tell them what that needs to look like. And so I love that. It's it's the way I understood my initial priesthood in the Episcopal Church was that same way as a sort of mid spiritual midwife in the community. Um, and I continue to believe that that's the role that I certainly feel called to play and that URI is a great place to do that because that's what the community expects. One of the images that comes to my mind as you're speaking is to think of these cooperation circles. And how many are there again? Over a thousand. Over a thousand cooperation circles in some ways as almost like sinews in the kind of larger mm -hmm. neurological structure. I mean, yes. on the one hand, they're independent, but they're also interdependent in this yes. sense 
What do you want that interdependence to look like? What does the world require of that kind of force working together around the world? So having spent a lot of my life working in around issues of peace and justice and healing in the in, in communities around the world, um, there is almost no greater negative power that than isolation on people who seek to make change in their communities. So the isolation that people experience uh, in trying desperately to make something happen in their own communities um, and the isolation from the resources, not just financial resources, but the resources of, 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 in, of um, possibilities of instinct, of uh, programs, of other kinds of ideas, um, to be cut off from that. Uh, isolates someone and to be able to go up against the great forces of the kind of shadows of destruction and of uh, violence and of conflict um, alone is is often an overwhelming task. So for me, this, as you describe it, this connecting the network, the web, the web of connection, first lets people know that they're part of a movement, a global movement that is, in fact, not just URI, but the global interfaith, intercultural movement is far bigger than the movements of people who seek destruction in our world. And so just to know that you're part of something that's huge and that's global and that is, uh, you're not alone. And then to be able to connect up those, that web, um, and to be able to share information, to be able to share best practices, to be able to amplify each group's voice through this network so that they are seen and acknowledged and recognized and their wisdom can contribute to the wisdom of the whole. That's that connected network. And we're sort of, you know, people have described us as sort of the spiders that, that kind of keep the web flowing, or you can imagine the folks that keep the internet, you know, connected. Um, that's sort of what we do in the URI network. What's great though, is that the, you know, the we in URI, the power of we, as we talk about it, um, is not is not the staff, is not, is not the, the, the structure. Uh, it's the communities. And so we're providing the pathways of connection so that they can organize collectively and feel empowered by that connection to accomplish, to move their dreams forward. I just spoke recently with two of these different cooperation circles and they really resonated with what you're saying. And one of them described it somewhat like, in terms of facing the challenges that we're facing today in the world, she described it somewhat like the, the sand that moves down an hourglass. And as things become restricted or constricted and challenging, there's something incredibly beneficial about being in proximity to one another, like those grains of sand working very hard mm -hmm. On, um, on substance, on things that matter. And that brings me to a question for you about accelerating peace. URI just convened a fairly significant gathering at Stanford University on the theme accelerating peace. Could you just say more about that? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that's happened in the 20-year arc of URI's time is that we have focused a lot on the internal connectivity of those thousand groups in 108 countries. What in the last five years, what we've what we've realized is that that network has become strong enough and become vital enough, and had started to kind of reach out and and know that the work the the work of combating religiously motivated violence, the work of building cultures of peace, justice, and healing, whether it has to do with the environment or violence reduction against women, um, or education or health, whatever the humanitarian. Uh, key issues are that that communities need, that that work is best done through partnerships and through partnerships beyond URI. So we've been focused a lot on connecting URI, the URI network up to other networks and, and particularly through the United Nations, through other international organizations, through other interfaith organizations and through local groups, other local groups. The Accelerate Peace Conference was a coming together of those partners. It was a coming together of the URI community, the leadership from all over the world, the grassroots leadership and our, and our staff, and 
Cooperation Circle members, together with some of our partners, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, and who's responsible for the Office of Genocide Prevention, folks who who bring this movement mentality. Valerie Kaur, the founder of the Revolutionary Love Project, and people got to see and hear each other, and I think a couple of really important things happened. One of which was policymakers and grassroots. Movement actors came together, people at the grassroots. That rarely happens. It just is a place where policymakers talk to each other, grassroots people work together, and there's often a big gap in between. And we wanted to close that gap and say that you know we wanted to lift up the voices of grassroots people in the context of lots of different people who are working at the policy level, um, and to connect that those resources to each other. So that's number one. The other thing was, which was great for the grassroots community there, is to be able to hear from some of these folks who are working at high levels in the policy world at the UN and others, how important they think the grassroots is, how important they think URI's work is, but also other work that's happening at the grassroots. And that it, again, it, it affirms that there is a need to kind of connect these levels of leadership, whether it's ordinary folk providing leadership in their communities, whether it's people who are senior leaders in their religious organizations or at, in international organizations, that we are a movement and that we function at various different levels. So Accelerate Peace gave us a chance to tackle some of these really important issues that the world is facing and to look at how interfaith action is a key component to global peace building and particularly interfaith action at the grassroots. You mentioned earlier what I heard is a concept of a union shadow, that there's shadows, that organizations like URI are at the forefront from grassroots to grass tips are at the forefront of responding to in different ways. And it makes me wonder even more about the theme accelerating peace. If some of those shadows today are what we mm -hmm. see is the rise of populism or of hate speech or of incitement to violence or violence outright itself, what is the role of accelerating peace? And what do you envision is just so necessary for the work we should be doing together? You know, so I, it's interesting, I was on the phone this morning to my colleague in, in Ethiopia, and he's seeing in Ethiopia at the moment the same kind of divide and rule political strategies of, of trying to get people to identify within a narrow construct of their own identity, whether it's a ethnic or nationalistic or religious, and to uh, position themselves as other than someone of a different different um, cultural, eth ethnic, or religious background, sort of like what we're talking about at the very beginning around one among many. It's the antithesis of that. And that the divide and rule, you, you divide people, you pit them against each other, and then you can control them. Um, and I think we see that just once again, as happened in the past in human history, once again, we see that being a primary political strategy. What's different about the moment is that it is being employed in some of the world's biggest democracies, where diversity and pluralism are in fact the motto of those countries, particularly India and the United States. Unity and diversity, e pluribus unum, these are the mottos of, you know, we are one people bringing together the many different forms of humanity, characteristics of humanity. But in India and the United States, um, that division along lines of narrow lines of identity is being used to separate people, pit them against each other, fan the flames of, of violence. A lot of people talk about peace building in instrumental terms. What is the What are the things we need to do in order to intervene, in order to intervene in conflict, in order to build peace? And there's a myriad of important things we need to do there. But when I think about your question, I, I think about the fundamental role of empathy and the building, the creating, the nurturing of empathy through establishing relationships between people who identify differently along various lines of human identity. Forging those relationships, creating context in which people can hear each other's stories where empathy and connection begins to emerge and that that 
empathy, that connection is actually probably not only the last line of defense, it's the first part of a building block when things get really tough and how we are able to confront the division by holding together in a sense of mm, partnership, collaboration, uh, peaceful relationship, productive relationship. So one of the ways to think about URI cooperation circles, which are made up of people of different ethnic backgrounds, cultures, beliefs, inherently, they have to be, they, they, that's part of the, the structure, is that they generate empathy, is that they're ge empathy generating communities. They also take that empathy and apply it to do various actions and various things. But I see us often missing what people would call the softer parts of peace building, the, the generating of empathy, the, the listening, the deep listening to another story. These are core ongoing functions that I think we have to be promoting in order for people to transform and come out of their kind of isolated, fearful place and enter into that spirit of being one among many as a beautiful thing and as a resource. I mean, we, the, 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 the environment around us, the world around us, the biosphere is, understands that diversity is essential for life. So in any part of our planet, the oceans, the land, the air, diversity of species, diversity of life is essential to sustain life. We know this. This is a scientific reality. Well, I think the sociosphere is the same way, that diversity of human beings is actually an essential element in sustaining and nurturing and growing our lives on this planet. And so claiming that, owning that, uh, promoting that, living that, I think becomes an essential component of peace building and interfaith peace building as we think about the spiritual um, aspects of our lives that connect us to each other. Thinking of the sociosphere for a moment, I, I was also, as we discussed at the Accelerating Peace Conference, and I had an opportunity to interview a number of mm -hmm. those individuals who were working inside of the life of URI, Sarah Oliver, Duncan Wietzel, and, and Rita Semmel were just three of many inspiring people. And I think one of the things that inspired me most, one of the virtues that they seem to exhibit that inspired me certainly, along these lines of empathy in the sociosphere, is that inside of empathy and generosity that's always outward facing in the world, there is this kind of husk or kernel of joy mm -hmm. as an end in itself that the work itself, whether it's happening in grassroots or grouse tips, in that sociosphere, that rich biodiversity you're talking about, is its own reward in the sense of, of joy that emanates from the work. We focus so much on best practices that we miss the kernel that I'm talking about, that kind of rare thing that also blooms inside of us and in communities when we're working collaboratively together. So I, I feel so strongly about this. I agree with you so wholeheartedly. And, and so I'm a grandchild of genocide. I'm, I'm, I'm Armenian. So there's nothing Pollyannic about the story of my family, most of whom were massacred um, in violent conflict. My grandfather, who escaped the genocide in, in Armenia, this wonderful, gentle, beautiful man who became a doctor, used to say, Joy and suffering are sisters. They always come together. That's part of our life, part of human existence. But one doesn't need to cancel out the other. That joy can live alongside suffering and struggle, that the two don't cancel each other out. In fact, they live as part of the human experience. And I, I believe that. And you see it in people like Rita. You see it in people like Duncan and Sarah and and in my grandfather, Baraslat, who was a joyful man, even though he his life emerged out of this horror of genocide. And when I've been in in the last years in Rwanda and in Cambodia, um, certainly in uh, talking with Holocaust survivors, um, in places in Bosnia, in places where we have seen contemporary genocide and ethnic cleansing. Um, you, the, what's amazing to me is to meet people filled with joy who have suffered horrific tragedy and that those two human 
experiences live side by side like siblings, like sisters in, in them. It's an extraordinary thing. I, when I interviewed Rita, she talked to me about her husband who landed on Omaha Beach on D-Day Plus 3 and what it meant for her to pursue a life over decades from 1934 until this current day at 98 years old. Suffering and joy are companions. And uh, she had no kind of predilections about something other than that. But she allowed that kind of joy to be a part of her everyday work. Fundamentally, it wasn't, as in my estimation, about interfaith work or intercultural work or those are the names we give it. It was about that deeper connection that I think you're speaking to. And if I can say with respect that your grandfather also spoke to you about. Going from someone who's 98 years old to say, this is a younger generation of leaders. These are all human beings that we're seeing across the world. Some of them are starting their own organizations. They're working collectively together. When you turn to those folks that are in a room or you're speaking with them, I think the listener would be interested to hear, mm. what are the two or three values as you're growing as a leader? Don't miss this value that should be a formative part of your own humanity and leadership within that. So first of all, when I think about speaking with you know, younger people, younger leaders. Um, and this was true when I was teaching in, in college. This is true when I was working with junior high and high school students. This is true when I was working for many years with children in, in after school programs. Um, in, our conversation is one among colleagues, among fellow peace builders, among fellow human beings, who all have wisdom to share. And I've always found that the, often the greatest learnings in my life have come from my interactions with children and young people who bring great wisdom into my life and into the world. So I, I want to start with that in, in that end. What I, I love about URI is that URI has children and young people who are leaders, not just youth leaders, but are leaders in our community. They, they are equal in their leadership um, to those of us that have other roles that we may have been assigned um, in the organization. And so one of the things to say is to be able to stand in that, uh, the fullness that you are, a unique being and that your experience in this world no one else has that each of us is a unique being and our view of the world our perspective on the world is unique and therefore is valuable to creating something to seeing something to understanding something greater than ourselves and therefore we need each other and we need to share those perspectives in order to really understand something that's larger than ourselves. Having said that and starting in that place of, you know, self-affirmation and self-love and, and the other piece for leadership is just that I, you know, live all the time it is how many mistakes that one makes, how, how constantly I'm reminded of how imperfect I am and that that is an incredibly important thing to embrace as as a um, as a leader, I, I had a strange advantage uh, in my life that I didn't see as an advantage for a very long time in this, in that I have been throughout my life a stutterer. And when I was a little boy, up until I was through college, I was a very severe stutterer. I would stutter and block and my, contort my face and try to get words out um, for most of my life. Um, and I still am, and I still I still will stutter. Um, but one of the things that I learned in that experience was the uh, was the reality of our imperfection. It was impossible for me to be perfect, no matter how hard I wanted to be. Audibly and visually, I was not. And so, the embracing one's imperfection um, and what I call seeking wholeness, not Perfection. Perfectionism is debilitating, and most leaders 
get um, rigid and isolated, and whether they're leaders in the in the educational world and academic world, or whether they're leaders in the political world or wherever, um, that they get hard and rigid and and sad um, when they are believing that they're supposed to be this perfect kind of you know paragons of leadership. When in fact we lead out of our mistakes and we learn from our mistakes. And we if we're transparent about that, and if we do the best we can, but we also are open to other people's, you know, bringing learnings to us that we can't see from ourselves, that puts us in relationship to each other in a different way. I need you to bring your reflections to me so that I can uh, learn and be better at what I do and be more informed about the world. And so that kind of radical humility, and quite frankly, for me, it started out as humiliation, right? It was, it was humiliation for a lot of my life and where people would, you know, react in ways that people do around someone who has a physical disability. Um, the fact that I'm, I'm, I've always loved to talk and that I'm very verbal anyway these days in my role, notwithstanding that learning of, of, of humility through that experience is always with me. Just for another moment, we have a number of young listeners who do feel humiliation. They feel there are complexities, difficulties in their lives. They feel like they're alone. They're the only ones dealing with it. Moving as you have done, as you're talking about, from feeling humiliated to humility um, without having to be perfect, just doing our utmost, f- falling forward well, putting one foot in front of the other. How do you, what would you tell those kids? Hang on, your leadership will grow with you, have faith in yourself. What's, what worked for you as a, as a child? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I think there are things that we can do when we feel isolated. Um, and that, again, is another dimension of isolation, right? The kind of when we feel uh, humiliated or sad or alone. Um, and so I want to I offer two things, one of which is, all, is the, the, the role that other people play in touching our hearts and being open to that to allow ourselves to be open to the support, the love, the care, the concern of a friend, um, of a person perhaps in our f- family, of a teacher, um, of someone who looks at you and sees you, not the, the disability or not the insecurity or not the, 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 even sees you better than you see yourself. I had people in my life when I was feeling very, um, discouraged and kind of um, insecure about myself, who believed in me and who saw something in me that was uh, that was really beautiful, even when I didn't feel that way. Now, there's another part to that, which is sometimes you you don't have that in your life. There's nobody you know around you. One of the things that I found was that I could offer that to others that I could find in my own hurt and my own isolation uh, the capacity to look for somebody else who was hurting too and to offer myself in loving relationship in a kind of kindness, just simple kindness to someone else. Um, and that that not only impacted their life, it it shifted something in me. It it grew something in me that that helped to heal and uh, that that pain, that that sense of of isolation. So, the receiving and the giving, the giving and the receiving of of simple kindness. Um, I actually think that the roots of solving the problems of the planet, whether it be war and violent conflict or environmental destruction, or whether it be the the health crises that we face, there's it, it starts with that kind of giving and receiving of kindness and opening ourselves, opening our hearts. Um, one of the last things that I learned late in my, my life, uh, as I just passed 60 years old, um, was about self-love. So self-love doesn't come easy and it takes a, it takes a lifetime often to really feel that sense of 
loving one's oneself. Um, so I'm so thankful for those who loved me in my life, even when I didn't love myself or who reached out to me and saw something. So to be open to that, um, but also to know that as I watch my two wonderful young sons who are not so young anymore, um, I watch them develop that capacity for love of self and love of other at a much younger age than I did. Um, I, I see the potential for that. And I see that in the young people that I work with uh, every day who are peace builders, who are, who are healing the world and healing their communities and speaking out against violence and uh, speaking on, up on behalf of each other um, and forging relationships around, across their communities and around the globe now uh, in virtual ways, um, claiming this, um, this human heritage, this destiny of the beauty of diversity and the possibility of us living in ways that love and support one another. Kindness, like empathy, uh, shouldn't be afraid to root and root deeply. These are not peripheral to our lives. They're actually at the center and accelerating peace in our own lives, as you're noting, or in the lives of others, or if our aspirations are for the whole world will require that kind of rootedness from us and to be kind to ourselves throughout. And rootedness is a good, good, you know, image, I think, because we are living beings like, like the plants that, that root in the earth. And, you know, there's some beautiful examples of the, the aspen grove, the aspen tree, or the redwood grove, the aspen grove, which is actually one kind of organism. It, it has many, many, many different trees if you look at it from the surface, but beneath the surface, the aspen grove is, is actually one tree. It's one organism that's connected at its roots. Another image there are the redwood forests, right? The tallest trees in the world, these huge trees, which you know well, that, that, that reach into the sky and yet have very shallow roots, but their roots are connected to each other. Their, their shallow roots extend broadly out, reach out, and then become interconnected with other roots in the redwood forest so that these huge trees um, actually support each other in being able to grow and to reach for the light and to be, you know, these, these immense living beings in the world. So my spiritual mentor, Howard Thurman, extraordinary African-American mystic and teacher, um, used to say that spirituality was the watering of one's roots, particularly in times of dryness. And so the question we ask ourselves, right, is what waters our roots? What, what are the things that nurture and feed and water our roots so that we can grow and support others in our growth? And, uh, and I think of that a lot. I think of that a lot. If you would like to know more about United Religions Initiative, read stories of interfaith in action, visit www.uri.org. And to learn more about Religica and our allies, take a look at www.religica.org. Thanks.